Thank you for that introduction, Cathy, and welcome to you all. Before I introduce to speakers, I'd like to acknowledge today's sponsors, Mr. Mehmet Saral of Saralcom and Mr. Adulis Aksu from Enix Consulting. It's a privilege to facilitate today's lecture, Faithful Responses to Climate Emergency, Acting and Hope, with Associate Professor Mehmet Ozalp and Theo Ormrod. First of all, let me introduce our first speaker, uh, Mehmet Ozalp. Mehmet is one of the most prominent Muslim community leaders in Australia. He is a scholar, a public intellectual, community leader, and author serving the community since 1992. Mehmet is an associate professor of Islamic studies and the director of the Center for Islamic Studies and Civilization, which he founded at Charles Sturt University. He is the founder and executive director of ISRA, the Islamic Sciences and Research Academy of Australia. And under his leadership, Sizak and ISRA pioneered Islamic studies courses at both an undergraduate and postgraduate level since 2011. Mehmet is the editor-in-chief of the Australian Journal of Islamic Studies. He serves on the executive committee of the Strategic Research Centre of Public and Contextual Theology. He serves on the Human Research Ethics Committee at the University of Sydney. He has been a serving as the Muslim chaplain at the University of Sydney since 2006 and at Macquarie University from 2006 to 2019. He was awarded the Australian Blue Star Award in Education 2011, Charles Sturt's Professional Excellence Award 2012, the Australian Muslim Role Model of the Year Award 2012, and the Australian Muslim Lifetime Achievement Award in 2018. Mehmet is the author of 28 publications, I won't list them all, one of his articles about to be published within the next few weeks is in a chapter entitled Caring for God's Creation, an Islamic Obligation. It's in an anthology I have edited. Mehmet is an editor's dream. There were so few corrections to make. Please welcome Mehmet Azalp. Thank you, Clive. That was embarrassing. And uh, I need to drop some of those hats uh, as well. Um, uh, I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. Uh, it's great to be back at Affinity. Affinity was my first home. I was involved uh, at, from the beginning of the organization, so it's really great to see it flourish uh, in the way that it does under Ahmed's leadership. Uh, thank you, Cousin Ahmed. <laughs> I'd I, I like to know what your DNA composition is. I've done it as well. I'd like to compare it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so our topic today is the environment, uh, and uh, I'm going to share with you, if, I can if we can have the presentation up, please. Um, uh, on the, at the practical or ethical dimensions, what Muslims are thinking of when it comes to environmental protection and response to climate change. Now, when we uh, talk about environmental protection, uh, the theological aspect to that is quite well established. Uh, Muslims have been writing about uh, how Muslims, what Islam and Quran says about the environment for over two decades now. And there are a lot, many publications about that, books as well, as well as articles. But what's really lacking is the, or what needs to develop, I should say, is the ethical and the practical aspects of environmental protection. Um, and uh, this is important because, uh, again, I'm writing for, a, I'm, I'm thinking of a Muslim audience in terms of developing that awareness and, and call to action within the Muslim world and communities. So in that respect, Muslims uh, uh, always look at any given action from an ethical perspective. Is it uh, in five gradation? Uh, is it allowed? Is it halal? Or is it haram at the two opposite ends? Uh, haram means prohibited. And, uh, and then you've got uh, not recommended, recommended and in, in the middle neutral. Um, so these, every action can be classified in Islamic jurisprudence and law under these five categories. So the question that I asked in that chapter was what, what is environmental action or action on environment or protection of the environment, what kind of an action is it, is it Islamically? Is it compulsory? Is it recommended? Um, because this was not clear and no one has done it before. 
Now, I'm not the greatest Muslim scholar in the world, but I wanted to begin, begin that discussion, begin that consideration, and hopefully this publication, once it's done, I'm going, will, will spread across the world and, and may pr uh, pr promote uh, or inspire other Muslim uh, theologians and jurists to look into it a bit more deeper. And uh, the key aspect to, the key challenge of any, anyone uh, for that matter is that when we talk about the protection of the environment, there's a competing need because we all live off the land. You know, if you're a religious person, you may think that God has created the world for human beings. And if a person is uh, secular or even materialistic or atheist, um, we tend to look at the world uh, from just a benefit perspective. So in both cases, the benefit comes to the fore. But what we are seeing right now is that the harm on the environment is is a, at an alarming rate. And we've just seen the bushfires, and a lot of people have been talking, linking that to climate change. And as usual, the politicians have been denying uh, the, the, that it, no, it's not linked, don't exaggerate. Uh, I think what the psychology behind these political responses is that if they recognize climate change as a problem, they have to do something about it. And I think this avoidance of having to do something about the environment is, is really driving the political lack of political response, particularly conservative politics. So in the narrative of the con conservative politics, environment has no place, and they have no solution to, to the climate change. And, and I think th it's deep down that is what's behind that denial and lack of action and so on. So, but what I argued in the paper is that uh, now the damage on, the, on, on Earth and the climate is so great that our very benefit that we get from, the, uh, from Earth is at risk, which means our very survival as, is at risk. It's come back full circle, that, that, that whole harm. It's not just we harm the environment, the, uh, the, the living species, and then we are separate from that. No, we're not. So what that makes, that makes climate change not, a, not just purely an environmental problem, but it is a, a social, political, and economic problem. So that brings it right into uh, an ethical framework. And I think this is where uh, Muslim theologians, jurists, have to really uh, studied and, and continuous writing about it. There has been a, a bit of a, a push to, not push, but uh, when, whenever you talk about uh, environmental protection, response to climate change, people say, yeah, but we've got so many other problems. This is Muslims. You know, I, I had the same answer to when I, when I was as part of Affinity, when we were going around in 2002, 2003, you know, oh, we've got to build bridges, we've got to do this. We've got other problems. You know, there was always other problems that got in the way. Uh, but I think now it is time that for Muslims to take serious look at, uh, at the, this uh, catastrophe that we're facing. You know, we're living in a globalized economy. We're living in a globalized internet. Um, and the technological changes are affecting the whole entire planet. But unfortunately, our responses are national, sometimes even individual, and to our own group. So we need that global response. At least it has to get to that level. Um, now, one good development that has happened in 2015 was this um, Muslim uh, or Islamic declaration on climate change, which is all available on internet. Uh, I recommend you to read that. But that also goes into the theology, what Quran says. Uh, but what's good about it is that it, it, there is a call to action from this declaration to um, Muslim world, basically, to do something. But there was no attempt to designate response to climate change uh, from an Islamic ethical framework, which I then took and, and attempted in that, uh, 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 in the, uh, the article, chapter that I have done. And just to, uh, 
My conclusion was uh, in that chapter that protecting the environment is an obligation. It is fard, you know, the, the Islamic word. Fard or wajib, you can use both words. Uh, for individuals, for Muslim organizations, and governments. Now, it's on individuals because every person has a carbon footprint. So there's an obligation on us to reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, there's an obligation on Muslim organizations because they are well resourced. They are, or should, maybe they have, they have some resources greater than the individuals and capacity to uh, influence society more than an individual can. Because as individuals, it's not enough for individuals to reverse the situation. That these obligation has to, is, is at all levels. And also, it's on governments um, uh, because governments have the greatest influence. And one thing about the governments is, unfortunately, is that uh, doing good through politics is very difficult. Just imagine solving all the uh, educational problem in Australia or problem of society. It's very difficult. But they can do a lot of harm very easily. Right? So keep that in mind. Um, so that's, that's what I, I put, and, uh, and I think the Muslim governments are starting to do something about uh, climate change, but it's not enough. The, they don't even have ministries, even if there is a ministry or it's a part of another ministry, it's a underfunded, just to save the day, but when it comes to, for example, in Indi Indonesia, there is a, um, Greenpeace is working with Indonesian government and the Ministry for Environment to reduce the plastic bags, but then they're clearing all these rainforests, right? So it just doesn't go hand in hand. And, uh, and also, later I will uh, show there's an example in Turkey as well. How am I going with time, Clive? Right. I'm at the time. So I just want to maybe finish off by uh, saying that uh, I don't think we should put too only emphasis on religion or religious arguments and teaching uh, in places of worship. That is certainly an influence and which is untapped uh, for Muslims. But I, I, I see that there are four uh, sources of influence uh, on Muslims and their motivation to act. Uh, firstly, there's an awareness through education, international and national activism that's happening in media. We all know now Greta. You know, this, she's become the symbol of that innocence of the child youth and the future generations. Um, and so all of that raises in Muslims an awareness to do something on the environment. Uh, friends, acquaintances and organizational influence is very much there. You know, we tend to follow what our friends are doing uh, and, um, and that's sometimes underutilized as well. And religion has an influence and also ultimately it's the individual conscience and concern for earth and wildlife, and our ability to control our desires, wants, desires, and comforts. You know, that's, at the end of the day, is the, one of the greatest issues. So I, the rest of the presentation, I've got all these uh, examples that Muslims are doing from around the world, in the Western world, uh, and also in Australia, and uh, finally I finished that with what we're doing in our own organization, because I'm sure uh, organizations are doing in their own right things that we don't know, we don't hear about, uh, but uh, I, I thought I can share with what we do at ISRA. But this is very interesting, and I think it's a very good example of an uh, interplay between politics and public opinion. Uh, this was the, from Turkey, it happened in this year, uh, there was la massive land clearing in one of the mountains in Gallipoli. It was a reserve for a gold mine. A Canadian company wanted to do gold, and there was, as soon as that came out, there was a massive uproar by the Turkish public, and they protested against by going there in their thousands to the mountains, and and you know a lot of social media campaign, some media covered it, uh, but it it was funny in a well there was no religious motivation to that. I think it shows that you know the, that. Muslim nations, and in this case, Turkey, Turkish people, have that uh, awareness and they're ready to act. But it was also a, a, 
a means to show their opposition to the government because <laughs> I think there was an element of that they didn't like or there are 50 percent of Turkish public don't like the government so this was a way to show that out so I think this politicizing climate change is good and not good in the uh, maybe we could discuss that in the question time thank you very much